chapter 10, verse 4. If the Spirit of the Lord rise up against thee, leave not thy place for yielding pacified great offensive. And that's a big 10 4. <laughs> Turn to the book of Ezra. I love the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. I love the book of Lamentations. I've just restudied and reread, and along with the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah. And may I say this? People ask me, said, how much do you study the Bible? I don't. It studies me. I just read it. I don't have any book but the Bible. That's all I want. It's satisfied. You get in a jam like I've been in, you better stay with it. I, I wouldn't have lived hadn't been for the Bible. I wouldn't have kept my mental balance. Some people think I lost it anyhow, but nevertheless, only reason I've lived is because I've lived in this book right here. I've not slept much at night. I've lived in this book. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And if you wonder what book I'm reading, it's the King James Version. I don't throw the half-breed books. I believe I'll preach tonight like this was my last sermon. This is it. This winds her up. It'd be good if all of us preached maybe every Sunday and Sunday night. This is my last call. This is my last message to be brought. In the book of Ezra, we find the answer to a lot of the things that we're facing today. And this brings us up. The Lord has wonderfully given me the scriptural answer. Somebody asked me not long ago, said, Brother, did it, did it ever occur to you that you could be wrong? I said, never did. <laughs> God doesn't bless you when you're wrong. He blesses you when you're right. The, eight, the 68 people I baptized the other night, all of them gave the testimony, that wasn't wrong, that's right. <laughs> this bunch of knuckleheads you heard saying a while ago uh, were a threat to civilization. And yet, now then, preaching, singing, testifying, only Jesus could do that. In the book of Ezra, we find the battle to build the house of God. And uh, there are three characters, Cyrus, Ahesu, Eris, and Darius, that I mentioned. And... It brings us up to date, and a lot of the churches are greatly concerned about losing their tax-exempt status. Man, we, we existed before there wasn't any taxes and anything. We Listen, nothing can stop the right kind of a church. And I'm going to tell you tonight, and it's the only way. I told you seven years ago how to get the state out. A bunch of them didn't believe, put out a big poster, said, roll off today, your church tomorrow. Well, and tomorrow's already come. California, um, all over this country, I could speak 365 days in a God and country rally every year. That's how many churches are concerned and states. And in California, I spoke to 400 preachers, another time 100. Over North Carolina, 250 preachers, and preachers are in the battle now. And we realize this is a preacher's battle. And before I get through, you might accuse me of being in politics, but I'm for, I'm for righteousness. And whatever I'm supposed to say, if the Lord will tell me, I'm going to say it tonight. Now, uh, chapter 4, they hired, verse 5, they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. Now then, skip a little bit further. And uh, you'll see them beginning to give the report to the political leaders. Verse 12. Be it known to the king that the Jews which came up from thee to us are coming to Jerusalem building the rebellious and bad city and have set up the walls there and joined the foundation. 13. Notice. Be it known now unto the king that if this city be builded and the walls set up against again, then will they not pay toll, tribute, and custom. And so thou shalt endamage the revenue of the kings. But get the next verse. 
Now because we have maintenance from the king's palace, <laughs> we're eating out of the feed trough. And if they're not going to pay our salaries, we're in trouble. And that's where we are today. I could dissolve the DHR, Department of Human Resources in Texas, by giving them what we pay our workers. They'd quit yesterday. Well, I said we've sent and certified the king. Chapter 5. They tried to stop them, then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, and the son of Jehoshadak, began to build a house of God, which is at Jerusalem, and notice the next phrase, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. There never has been anything built in America worth building or lasting without preachers of the right kind being in it. Preachers of the nation builder. Now notice a little bit further. They said, they came to the prophets and to these folks and said, Who hath commanded you to build this house and to make up this wall? What are the names of the men that make this building? We'd like to get the names, please. We'd like to check your records. Is that up to date? Is that what they're doing today? But the eye of their God was upon the nails of the Jews that they could not cause them to cease till the matter came to Darius. Now notice. Be it known unto the king that we went to the province of Judea to the house of the great God, verse 8, which is builded with great stones and timbers laid in the walls. This work goeth fast on and prospereth in their hand. Verse 10, we ask their names also to certify thee that we might write the names of the men that were the chief of them. And thus they returned us, answered, saying, We are the servants of the God of heaven. Man, we don't have to give our names to you. We don't work for you. We're working for God. I'm going to ask you again. Hear me out tonight. I told you seven years ago, and we'd not have any of this mess we're in today if the preachers had paid attention. The state has no right in the church unless they're coming to repent. They don't need to go in the office. They need to go in the altar. And I'm not just mincing words. I believe it's time for the state uh, to be asked out of the church. Now then, they came to Darius and said, uh, they said, then Darius, the king, made a decree. Back there a long time, and now here's where we are now in our case in Corpus Christi, Texas. In Texas, and fellas, uh, this is free the nation. The whole nation can be free after November the 17th. You wait and see. I've never asked for a shortcut. I've never failed to go to court when I knew I was going to jail. It is contempt of court, contempt of court. Uh, because, uh, and, and really what they passed was contemptible. And I had to be in contempt. <laughs> it was an unrighteous decree. Read it in the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 10 and chapter 30 when they said we're going to have to, uh, to cease the Holy One of Israel. The battle's not against Lester Olaf. It's not against the homes of Rebecca Home and Home. It's against Jesus. That's where the miracles come from. I've never performed a miracle, but I've sure seen a lot of them performed at the hand of Jesus through this book right here. So they said uh, to Darius, uh, then Darius made, the, uh, made uh, the king made a decree and search was made and notice, there was found at Achmetha, this is what we're fixing to find right now. There was found in the palace, that is in the province of the Medes, a roll, that's the constitution. We're fixing to roll out the roll. And something's going to happen. Fellas, I'm sick and fed up to my neck with lobbying at the state capitol. It's a waste of preacher's time. It's a waste of money and everything. We don't need any more laws. We've got to go with the Constitution. Amen. You make them this year, you've got to go make them again the next time. Fight a bunch of bureaucrats. We need freedom, the kind of freedom that the Constitution... Listen, what kind of Americans signed the Declaration of Independence? Fifty-six of them. What did they do first? Those men, they were not outstanding Christians as far as I know. 
they were just good, looked like uh, nation builders. They wanted the right kind. They wanted freedom. They wanted to be free from the religious and, and political tyrants of England, and so they came over here. Now, when they got ready to write our Emancipation Proclamation and provide uh, safety areas for the church, what did they do first? I don't know who it was, but somebody said the first thing we better do is to see that the state cannot get back in the church. And they said that's number one, and that is amendment number one. The very first thing Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or the free exercise of their power. Brother, they protected the church. Now then, they said, all right, we're going to make a study. And the king, notice, in the first year of Cyrus, the king, the same Cyrus, the king made a decree concerning the house of God in Jerusalem. Let the house be builded. The place where they offered sacrifices and let the foundation there be strongly laid. And it begins to tell how to do it. And now then, when they found this role that had been written and ignored and dust covered, in verse 7, he said, and this is where we're coming to right now. And brethren, we've got to get here. Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the heirs of the Jews build this house of God in his place. Now then, render unto Caesar. Have you ever heard that? Boy, they've called me on the carpet. I've been in human relations committee meetings, and which turned out to be inhuman. And... Um, uh, the welfare department, neither well nor fair, and then it turned into the DHR uh, Department of Human. Preachers, you listen to this preacher a moment. And I'm interested in you. I have no, I have no selfish acts to grind. I'm going to make it whether you do or not. I made up my mind. If you want to go, fine. If you don't, I'm going anyhow. You can sit back and peep through the bushes and gaze at the moon if you want to and bay it like a dog at night. But brother, as far as I'm concerned, it's time to do something beside look around. years ago I didn't start the war I'm not a fighter by nature not as a Christian and when I was in the flesh I'm mean, just too small to fight I weighed 80 pounds for three years everybody could whip me unless my brother took up for me but uh, since God called me into the ministry when there's two things that are violated I got a right to fight number one when they violate the law of the Lord I don't have to come under Mr. John Hill said to me, the Attorney General, and he's no longer Attorney General, and he's no longer Governor. He didn't get elected. An unknown man by the name of Bill Clements came in to be Governor, and you know who put him in, don't you? Me and the friends that we have in Texas gave him an 18,000, and it can be done. God removed those that had no respect for the work. Governor Doff Briscoe, who had nothing to do with me, I couldn't get in his office, he wouldn't answer my call, he wouldn't write me a letter. He's no longer governor, he's hell. Yeah. Folks, it's a serious thing, really it is. It scares me. My wife said to me the other day, I said, honey, it scares me to death to book you. It's not booking me, it's booking the cause. See, in other words, she said, I've watched the judgment of God fall. I, was in, I landed in Tucson, Arizona. You remember Judge John Collins? You remember the man that said, I want all 50 of our Arizona children? There's one of them right there. Said, I want every one of them out of there. Said, little Lester's trying to run a home like his dad did six years ago. I said, will it work then? He fought. I landed in Tucson the other day. And I said, where's Judge Collins? Said, he's out in the pasture. He's out in the field trying to farm. He's been defrocked. There are now six dead. The man who declared war on us fell dead. The man who is the head of the DHR just resigned along with his associate. The woman who sought all these years, and I'm trying to bring you up to date a little bit. We've had the oldest Christian day school in Corpus Christi, Texas, and it's been on death row for four years. They combined the two cases and said, we're going to try them both. Just a few weeks ago, they uh, notified my lawyers and said, the Park Avenue day school is now free. We're not going to bother. Step number one. 
And the lady, Mary Moon, who fought us so hard to try to close the home and harass us, she's dead with cancer. The county attorney who would not hear our case shift us to Austin and said I wouldn't touch it, he died with cancer. The woman who gathered all the filth for the Rebe against the Rebecca home and faded to the, uh, to the sewer line, the Caller Times paper of Corpus Christi, Texas, she was fired for being a lesbian. The man who got on 60 Minutes and said Roloff is a con man, I'm thankful he'd made it out to the house and apologized, had dinner with me and died on Friday of the same week. I'm just simply saying, folks, God is still in the vengeance taking vengeance. You don't have to worry about that. Notice what did the king say? The only thing I'm going to ask of you all now, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet savors under the God of heaven and do what? Pray for the life of the king and of his sons. That's what we're supposed to do. He said, that's all expect, that I'll expect of you. But I tell you what, he said something else. He said, also I've made a decree that whosoever will alter this word, let timber be pulled down from his house, and being set up, let him be hanged thereon, and let his house be made a dunghill. Now then, let me ask you this. We're strong on saying Jesus Christ yesterday, today, and forever. Is he really? Has God changed his mind about sin tonight? I'd like to bring you up to date and then give you a challenge from this old book. I said I didn't start the war. I had nothing to do. I was just going on. We've been operating homes for all the years. But finally they came out with a little book. And they said, this, these will be your new rules. You know, I said, I got mine. They said, you don't understand. There's been a law play, play, passed, and we have just rewritten. I said, I've just reread these. <laughs> they said, uh, uh, you don't understand. The seer said, do you realize that you're the only unlicensed home left in Texas, and you're going to have to line up? I said, with the King James Version, I'll line up. <laughs> now, that makes a fool out of you in the eyes of the world, but it's right. Can you imagine, you preachers, listen to me a minute. Can you imagine the Department of Human Resources setting standards, requirements, and rules and regulations for the Department of Divine Resources? How stupid can we be to let Mer Madeline Murray O'Hare and the humanistic crowd set rules and regulations for the church, the future bride of Christ? How would you like for the state to set the rules and regulations for your sweetheart? You're going to get married during they come out and say, now look here, you're going to wear this and you're going to do this and so forth. How would you like that? What do you think God thinks about it? Jesus thinks about it. Well, I know what some of you are saying because you've been taught that. You've come out and as dear doctor said a while ago, you're professionals. Go to work and pray and preach. I know there's one thing he impressed me with and that is just preach. Preach! Be instant in season, they close the season, keep a shooting. <laughs> and dear friend, can you imagine the state? See, the question is this, who's going to be Lord? Let me give you the laws quickly. The law of the Lord is perfect. Do you believe the church is the only thing in Louisville tonight that has any prospects of perfection? Do you think Jesus is coming to pick up the, one, the Kiwanis Club? Do you think he's going to pick up the Lions Club? Do you think he's going to rapture the Optimus Club? Do you think, uh-uh. Do -uh. you think he's going to stop and rapture the Capitol? Hmm? Oh, he's coming after the church. And... If the church is going to be like they sing a glorious church and uh, without spot or wrinkle, then it better have some perfect standards. Amen. Why would you settle for less than that? And I know what the lady said, Brother Olaf. Don't you believe that a man of God, in a public meeting where they had me on the carpet many years ago, and they said, Brother Olaf, don't you feel that a man of God ought to be subject to the higher powers. Have you ever heard that? I wish I could get you straightened out on that. I mean, a little pipsqueak come along 
And, and they said, I said, higher powers, I guess I am. They called me to preach. I said, it's them lower powers that's bothering me. Can you imagine the state having the audacity to think they're the higher powers? You say, well, what do you think the higher I don't have to think. I know it. It's God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the King James Version. That's the higher power. Now get that settled in your soul. A bunch of ignoramuses try to beat you to death with Romans 13. Don't even know where it's in the New Testament or Old Testament. <laughs> lady got up and she said, there's a scripture somewhere in the Bible, I believe, that says you're to be subject to the higher powers. I said, that's Romans 13. I love it. And the man who wrote it was in jail for people like you when he, when he wrote it. That's right. Now then, where are we? You say, what have you got? You know what they said? John Hill said to me, he's the attorney general, he said, Brother Olaf, I hate to see you go to the Supreme Court. I really do. It's going to take a lot of your life, a lot of your energy, a lot of money. Cost the state a lot. I said, I know. He said, what if when you get to the Supreme Court of the United States and they rule against you? I said, it'll just prove that there's some more people wrong. <laughs> No, you're not looking at a smart aleck. I've washed these eyes in tears every day for seven years. I've died a thousand deaths. And I'm not complaining, I'd do it again because I had a good time all the time I've been in it. And the Lord's blessed. A colored man stood up in, in, in Indianapolis and he was, spoke before I did. He said, it's, I'm glad to be your mahogany brother. <laughs> And he said, uh, people ask me, because they know I've been through a heap, and said, ask me if I'd go through them valleys again. I say, very quickly, I sure would. Yeah. They said, would you? Yeah. He said, I won't get them same blessings again. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Two verses, Exodus 1, 12. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied. Yeah. Boy, you talk about turning them out population explosion going on on Israel's side, huh? And one of them little old boys that got born over there was named Moses and had a lawbreaker for a mother and a daddy. He lived and died in contempt of court. <laughs> Climbed a mountain when he's 120 but the man, and served 40 years for being a, con, uh, being a murderer. I tell you, some, the preacher's talking about Dr. Rollins talked tonight about how God can use. Did you know that we're indebted to three ex-convicts for most of the Bible? The lawyer, Moses, and I'm not a criminal. I just believe in breaking the laws that ought to be broken. <laughs> Unrighteous decrees. The law of the lands, my Caesar. That's the Constitution of the United States of America. <laughs> Moses! met the Lord at the age of 80 at the burning bush and single-handed he took over three million slaves out of Egyptian bondage. God's not too strong on committees. Have you ever found that out? <laughs> Moses, the lawyer. You know who came back when Jesus had the summit conference? The lawyer. You know who came with him? The prophet. The law and the prophet. There they came. Moses, I can see him with his little briefcase in his hand. <laughs> All of his cases, you know. Jesus said, what you got on your mind? said, I just want to know if you're running on time. I got a heap of promissory notes in here. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> ah, listen, Jesus said... I'm nearing the cross and I'm not coming down until it's finished. <laughs> you go back and tell them as their lawyer that the debt will be paid. Amen. Peter jumped up and said, Building program! <laughs> Three tabernacles, Moses, Elijah lifted off and said, Forget one for us, we're going home. 
We've had all this down here we want. <laughs> ah, listen, dear friend. This old book's got all the questions and all the answers. And it has the strength that you and I need in order to make it. I want to mention some things tonight that I think of interest in, uh, to all of our preachers. You say, Brother Wolof, what is the answer uh, to our church facing the state? Are we going to have to lobby all the rest of our lives? You know, you know what the Attorney General told me? He said, Brother Wolof, do you know who defeated the bill to protect you and keep your homes open? I said, well, I think I do, but you go ahead. He said, it was a Southern Baptist lobbyist. And he called his name, said, man, he came down there and spent all the time he had and said, and 191 Baptist preachers, my schoolmates of another day, voted unanimously to put everything under the welfare. One of them said in the paper in the front page, we'd like for the state to see that we do it right. Folks, we're a bunch of crazy idiots in this country. Thirty-five years ago, I made two predictions. Number one, I'll go to jail before my ministry is over, the way this thing goes, and that came. Number two, I said that America will be a big, glorified, insane institution run by its own inmates, and there she is. <laughs> While I'm on that, lest I forget, is uh, J.B. Buffington here? J.B., are you here? Where are you? Okay, buddy, just keep standing. Have you ever read that book? I, I read it. It's, it's a fantastic Bible reasons why I cannot vote for Jimmy Carter. Now, I'm giving account for what I'm saying, but we'll never be able to stand another four years like we've stood the last. The home will be gone. J.B., I commend you for writing that book, buddy. That's a great book. Thank you. Now let me give you what I, where I think we stand. If we are where, one scripture that I'm going to give you, they mock the messengers of God. They despised his words. They misused his prophets until... The wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people till there was no remedy. Second Chronicles 36, 16. Now, if we're there, it's all over. You can stick your head in the sand, you can hope, you can wish, and you can spit and pray and hoot and holler, but buddy, let me tell you something. There are three things that's happened in America that has brought about her doom, and I don't anticipate great worldwide revival, not even in America. I see no signs of revival. I see the deadest bunch of churches across this country I've ever seen. No revival fires are burning anywhere. Amen. Say what you want to. Amen. And I didn't come here to get an amen. I, you can holler old me, whatever you want to holler. But I believe I see. Number one, we voted liquor in. Every nation that ever died, died drunk. Amen. America is the drunkard nation of the world and she's doomed. Number two, we've endorsed and paid with our tax money, and you've heard no doubt in the conference already, for the killing of babies. God will never let us live for that. Number three, we have now accepted and glorified a new way of life, which is a way of death, and that's the Sodomites fill this land right now. They're the boldest, meanest bunch alive today. And they are going to provide with their reprobate minds the violence of the end time day. You wait and see. I'm not through. I believe there's a way, at least for those of us, to have some revivals in our own churches. Win people to Christ in our own community. People are getting desperate. You go out with your buses, good. You work hard, that's good. We have 50 people knocking on our door every 24 hours. Brother Stan, I'll be in, uh, uh, I'll be in Roanoke tomorrow night. I'll be in Richmond Friday night. The paper just came out and said, Brother Stan, that you have a patrol with a shotgun 
that patrols all night long and dares anybody to walk out of the building. That's in the paper. That's, in the, that's going to be interesting when those dudes come to the service Friday night and I have the privilege of addressing them. Yeah. Isn't that something? Talk about lies, and I'm going to get around to some of that. We face the same enemies today. Jesus faced in his day. We just hesitate sometimes to call them by name. You know what we've lost in America? We've lost the sinfulness of sin, and we've lost the fear of God. The prophet was a man not loved but feared and respected. Elijah <laughs> didn't get into those medals people been handing to me, but I'll tell you what he did. He killed all of Jezebel's ministerial lines. <laughs> and he was human enough uh, to pitch a pity party in Juniper Jungle. And that's where a lot of y'all stay. Lord, have mercy. A fellow asked the other day, he said, how many of you had you have arrived many years ago? I think the Bible sets the example for everything preachers are supposed to do. When King Uzziah, the greatest king that ever lived, that is in his day, 52 years, 52 years, he sat on the throne. He, he made tremendous improvements. He was a tremendous man. He walked in the shadow of great prophets. One of them was Azariah. When he walked down to the temple, and fellas, this is just as real as it needs to be. When he walked down to the temple and walked in the temple, the preacher evidently was not there. He decided he'd pull his rank, walked up in the pulpit. Uh, that's what I'd call it. He got out all the paraphernalia and decided to burn incense. You remember that? The old prophet came up the sidewalk or up the cobblestone street or whatever, and he said, I believe I smell incense, and it's coming from the temple. I wonder who could be meddling in my place. And he walked in. Now, preachers, this is exactly what I said seven years ago. You didn't pay any attention, a bunch of you. But you're listening tonight. Because you know you're there because the state's already walked up in your church. And when Azariah walked in the temple, he looked up and saw the king, and the, the incense was rising, and the king was smiling, and the king, I, so much as to say, aren't you proud of your king? Not only king, but I'm priest now. And I've watched you do it so much, I know how to do it. Come and join me. Yeah. Call channel 13. Get our picture. Mm-hmm. That's the way the modern is to do it. Well, that old prophet made a 180, beat it down the street and come back with 80 preachers and they came back with the secret that I told you then, I tell you now. Only five little letters and two words and two syllables and when they walked down the aisle and looked him in his tonsils and said, Get out! They didn't say, If you please, Your Honor, would you do me a favor of stepping down and let me finish the search? Get out! I said it seven years ago. I'm still saying it. And we're nearing the victory right now. The Lord, and it's not been any hard feelings between me and them. Not a bit. The lawyer that put me in jail so many times called me and said, Brother Olaf, would you please come and speak to the lawyers of Austin, Texas? They need to hear your message. I said, set the time. I went up there. He introduced me has the most tenacious man he'd ever met in all of his life. <laughs> and I took my text from the book of Acts, I mean the book of Luke, chapter 11, Woe unto you lawyers. <laughs> and I was serious about it. I said, you've taken away the key of knowledge. You know what the key of knowledge is? It's the Holy Spirit. It's not college and university or me. It's the Holy Spirit. The law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the land, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death, the law of faith, the law of love, and the law of Christ. Those are my laws. Those are Christians' laws. And the only ones we're obligated to go by. And so I said, get out. You know what they said to me the other day? The governor, Governor Bill Clements, he said, Brother Wolf, you finally convinced me that you're not going to take a license. 
And the judge called me. Now, you listen to this, folks. We're going to win. We're going to win. Uh, God just doesn't hurry like I ask him to. <laughs> and so, uh, but the judge called me in his office and said, Brother Olaf, can you take a license with no rules and no regulations? We've got to settle this case. It's gone on so long. He reached in his desk and pulled out the Bible that I gave him in 1977. And I said, Judge, if I could have taken the license, I'd have taken it in 1973 before you put me in jail the first time. I said, license means the old King James plays second fiddle to the rules and regulations. You deny the Lordship of Christ, or I would if I accept. I deny the leadership of the Spirit and the authority of the Word of God. And I said, I'd have to apologize to John Bunyan when I get home. I'd have to apologize to George Washington and his old horse Lexington if he's around. <laughs> Folks, you better listen to me tonight. I'm only doing, and, and let me say this quickly, I never would have made it if it hadn't been for you preachers and Christians, I, you know that. And I, I don't have time, I faced legal crisis, I faced physical crisis in the middle of it. And I, felt, I faced mental crisis in June of 1976 when I was in jail, in that old antique of a jail. I faced the mental crisis of my life. The devil came and knocked on my door that night, walked into those old bars, and said, now then, I know everything's fuzzy. I've got you at the right time. There's three rock and roll deals going. I mean, radios at two o'clock in the morning, as loud as they could go. <clears throat> I had my airplane earmuffs on, but I gave out holding them. And when he said, I've come to get your mind, brother, that's the most serious moment I've ever lived in my life. I was afraid to close my eyes. I'd not eaten a bite. I had not slept any. I could not rest. I was listening to that horrible, horrible rock and roll. Oh, the devilish beat and sound. And, uh, you know, Dr. Rawlings, I went into uh, Memphis a week ago tonight. And I came up to make the approach and so help me, I had to go to the Elvis outer marker. I said, is there any other way to get in this town except going over that? Brother Elvis Presley, I mean the, the dope head, the one that's wrecked so many homes and lives, and they're sticking his name up. And you pay to go through the deal to see where he used to be. And he died on dope, a broken home, and all the rest. Preachers, don't you come telling me anything about your Christian rock. There ain't no such thing. You talk to our boys and girls about that filth, and you'll find out. Leads down the road of MRO. Would you let me take the time to say something, though? It'll shock you a little bit. I, Stan, you remember the night where you there? I apologized to my church some oh, two months ago for saying, uh, and I, I'd always said there's nothing good about rock and roll. And I said tonight, and I found out today that I've been wrong. And I said I got the clipping right here in my hand, and I'm going to apologize to my church and to everybody on radio for saying there's nothing good. I said, according to this report right here, there's a family, a lovely family, and there was a family that invaded them and got in the walls and they did not know what to do. The man in desperation turned the rock station on as loud as it go, stepped out of the house, and every pole cat in the wall went. <laughs> now the paper said, the paper said, and dear friend, that's the truth. He said there wasn't a pole cat left. They said it's not fit for any of us to listen to that. <laughs> That poison and dope was brought by the Beatles, along with a lot of other things, and God's preachers and people. You ought to never have one of those nasty records in your home. Never let your children tune into that kind of a radio. It'll kill their mind. Turn them against you. And all you got to do is talk to our young people to find out. Now then, in closing, I'd like to say something more important than all I've said even though I believe we're going to win in the courtroom. 
the, the judge said to me, Brother Olaf, I've got to give you your day in court, and I'm going to. And he said, I'm going to consider one thing, and that's all. Does the state have a right to license and control the church? I said, that'll be the day. And uh, my old lawyer, Mr. William Ball, that's one of the major cases in this country, he's pouring in the valley. I mean, he's, he's raring to go to the courtroom and lay it out. It'll be the greatest education during those four days for the preachers of this generation. You won't need to go anymore to lobby. You won't have to have an organization to do this. Once we're freed under the Constitution, we'll be free. The Constitution still stands just like it always did. Now then, in closing, I want to ask some questions. Number one, who killed Jesus? How did he die? This has been sweet to my heart the last few weeks. You say commercial killers killed him? No. You say Roman soldiers killed him? No. You said they drove enough nails through his hands to kill him? No. You think they pierced his side deep enough to kill No. First of all, the father permitted a contract to be put on him by the mafia. The mafia constituted was the news media, the scribes. And you read the 23rd chapter of the book of Matthew. Number two, it was the establishment of the state. Number three, it was organized religion. Those were the three that thought they finished him off. But I've got a conviction as deep as my soul that they couldn't kill him. They just couldn't kill him. Oh, I, it's true they drained his blood out of him and that was where his life was, but they, they couldn't kill him. If they could have killed him, he'd still be dead. If they could have killed him, he'd have never got up. And Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I'll just pick it up again. And dear friend, I believe that Jesus was counting blood drops. I believe he was watching his blood flow. And I believe when he heard that drip, 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 drip. And when it quit dripping, he said, I believe that's all of it. Oh no, one drop wouldn't save you, it took all of it. Amen. He gave his life and the life of the flesh and the blood. And his blood ran out and he said, uh, as he realized the blood had stopped flowing and dripping, he said, it's finished. Amen. And then he said, you may die. And that's it. Oh, the soldiers said, say, no need breaking his bones, he's dead already. They didn't have enough strength in the Roman Empire to break his little finger. You see, he wasn't coming out walking on crooked feet, brother and limb. He, he'd need those to walk on again. Now the next question I want to raise is to close the message. Did he enjoy three days of lovely, sweet, wonderful soul sleep and rest in the cemetery? He had a brand new tomb. And Joseph of Arimathea said, My, let me give him a resting place. Listen. Oh, hear me. You got your Bible? Turn to the book of Revelation. Boy, I tell you, I've enjoyed this the last few days. Chapter 1. Alpha and Omega, beginning and ending. Alpha and Omega, first and the last. And then we come into that um, uh, 18th verse. He said, fear not, that 17th, fear not, I'm the first and the last. Now let's pause there a minute. What did he do? Could you put eternal life in a sepulcher? Why, that'd be as bad as this soul sleep bunch. Yeah. 
There's a cemetery right across the street from me. And the fellow's already given me a plot and a family, all that kind of stuff, you know. And, uh, but I've got a conviction that I'll never go in that cemetery. You say, what you going to do? I'm going home. What do you think I'm going to do? You got any more silly questions? You don't believe in soul sleep, do you? How can you stop eternal life? I got it. It's given to me by grace. What did Jesus do, reckon, during those days? Do you think he just wandered around town? No. I think he got him a fast airliner to hell. Now, if he went all the way from me, he went to hell for me, too. But he didn't just go down there to sightsee. I think he went down there and if they got a doorbell, he rang it. The devil said, see who's at the door. He said, who is it? He said, it's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I thought you was dead. No! I want to see the devil. No, he's not the little sissy that some of y'all think he is. He's not the little Casper Milk Toast uh, puppet that some of y'all think. Oh, be nice. Just be nice, you know. Brother Lemmy, he's not the little flower Jesus that some of you think he is. See. Oh, you'd say, but Jesus wouldn't fight, brother. Well, he wouldn't. What do you think happened when he got baptized? Who all was there that day? God the Father looked out of heaven and said, Better listen to him, that's my son. Jesus was there, and then the Holy Spirit come floating in like a dove, didn't he? And sat right down on his shoulder. Said, let's get together. As soon as he walked out, you know, walked up old smutty face and said, hey, big boy. Let's see who's going to run this thing. He said, where you want to meet? Hmm? He wasn't chewing his fingernails and said, no, I'd rather not. You know, I haven't got my deacons with me. <laughs> and I, huh? Fiddle on it. He said, where do you want to meet? He said, in the wilderness. He said, I'll be present and on time. And dear friend, I just said the best way I know it. I said all over the nation. I'll say it again tonight. He hit him three licks with the King James Version and tore him up. And that's it. A woman said to me in New England the other night, she said, Brother Olaf, I maybe ought not say this, but a lot of people think you're crazy. <laughs> she said, what is your answer to that? I said, well, sister, if I am, I'm heading toward the most glorious insane institution you've ever heard of. And there's a heap of nuts going with me. <laughs> Don't you feel sorry for people like that, really? Ah, listen. The devil said, all right, what do you want? I said, I want the keys. You want my keys? He said, I want the keys. He said, which one? To hell and death. That's the two things people are afraid of, isn't it? See? The old devil kind of reached down his old key string and took them off and Jesus put them on his. And told hell goodbye forever. Yeah. I couldn't get in hell if I wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. No way. Yeah. And I couldn't get in the cemetery. He went over there and locked up the grave. I can't get in. Yeah. Now, let me. Now, if you think y'all are having a good time, I'm going to show you who's doing the preaching, and I'm going to see what he said now. Notice, right here. Now, it, Jesus is preaching. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Well, he liked his preaching, didn't he? I do too. I'll guarantee you. Right in the middle, he said, Amen. See? Got the keys to death and the grave and hell. Notice, and have the keys of hell and of death. Oh, I'll tell you, dear friends, 
We have a wonderful Savior. No need being afraid of anything as small as the church, as the state. No need be afraid of the DHR, Department of Human Re No need be afraid of a wicked society. And dear friend, as I close this message tonight, this book right here, I love more than I ever loved it before. The last seven years of my life, I know people have said, Where is Brother Olaf's God? It's where he's always been. The daddy stood at the grave and they lowered the casket and put the flowers on it of his soldier boy. He walked to the preacher's side and said in confusion, Where was God when my boy was killed? The preacher tenderly said, Same place he was when his son died on Calvary. No man ever died like Jesus died. No man ever lived like Jesus lived. Nobody ever got up like Jesus got up. Nobody ever came back like he's fixing to come back. No ever, nobody ever built a PBX telephone system like he built with a private line for four billion people to talk at one time. And no ODs. Dear friends, hear me. We have the inside track. I want my bunch to come. I want to sing a song and close the message. Victory is ours. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Jesus never did put up with defeat while he was down here. And he won't from up there if we'll put our trust and faith in him. An old song we revived years ago. Dark the sin that soiled man's nature. Long the distance that he fell. Far removed from hope and heaven. Near to deep. Despair and uh, hell, but there was a fountain open, and the blood of God's own Son purifies the soul and reaches deeper than the stain has gone. Conscious of that deep pollution sinners wander on in the night even though the shepherds calling still they fear to face the light there's the tender consolation that should melt that old heart of stone this sweet bond of gilded reaches deeper the stain has gone. Oh, unworthy we who wandered, and our eyes are wet with tears as we think of the love that sold us through those old dreary, wasted years. Yet we'll walk the holy highway. For the pure, the blood washed alone, knowing Calvary's fountain, it reaches deeper than the stain has gone. When with holy throngs we're standing in the presence of the great King, and our soul, they're lost in wonder as the white robe choirs shall sing. Then we'll praise the name of Jesus with the millions all around the 
throne. We're going to praise him far. The blood that reached us deeper than the stain has gone. We'll praise the Lord for full salvation. God still lives upon the throne. Stand together with bowed heads.